I invite you to open up with me to the book of Acts and chapter 13 this morning. And as you are turning there, we'll just give you a little orientation here as to where we are in the book of Acts. We're about halfway through, not quite halfway through, but this chapter in a way starts a new um, section of the book of Acts where we focus for the remainder of Acts really on Paul's missionary journeys. And those of you who are maybe a little bit familiar with Acts know that a big portion of this book, over half of it really, deals with Paul and his ministry and his missionary journeys, of which there are three. Chapter 13, where we are this morning, is the beginning of the first missionary journey of Paul. And so we are entering that part of the book of Acts now. And this morning we will be looking at Acts chapter 13 Uh, And I will be reading the whole chapter. So I encourage you to follow along as we read God's word together. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Alemus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and, motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, 
as also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, You will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul, what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit." Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servants, for Paul, for Barnabas, for Mark, and for many others, Lord, who gave their testimony and testified to you and to the truth of the gospel in their day. And Lord, we are reminded as we read these words that we are part of that same church. The same church that they were a part of, we also are a part of, Lord. The same calling which you gave to them, you gave to us. And so as we read about these men and about their testimony and their ministry, we ask, Lord, that you would use this to teach us, to transform us, to make us more faithful as your disciples, your ambassadors, your witnesses. Lord, give us ears to hear this morning, we pray. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the ways that theologians have described the church throughout the centuries is to say that if you are part of the body of Christ, you are part of one of two groups of people. You are either part of the church triumphant or you are part of the church Militant. Now, you may not have heard those terms before, and it's not two different churches we're talking about. It's one church, but two groups. What do those mean? Well, the church triumphant is that group of Christians who have gone on to be with the Lord and are in heaven. And we call them triumphant because we understand that they have fought the good fight, they have finished the race, they have entered into their heavenly rest, as Paul says, and therefore they are triumphant in being, inheriting internal, eternal life. On the other hand, there's the church militant, which is that group of Christians who are still alive here on earth. And you might think, boy, that's a strange way to describe the church on earth as the church militant. We typically don't think of the church as a militant organization. Uh, Far from it, we often think of the church as a very uh, peaceful organization and committed to loving our neighbor and all of those things. Why would it be called the church militant? Well, it's called the church militant because we recognize that Christians on earth are engaged in a battle. But the battle is not a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. And we see many, many places in Scripture where the Christian life is talked about as a battle or as warfare. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 
He says, this charge I entrust to you that you may wage the good warfare holding faith and a good conscience. There's a warfare that the Christian is to fight and it involves faith because it's a spiritual battle. Listen to what he says in 1 Timothy 6.12. He says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of of many witnesses. There, according to Paul, there's a war to be fought. There, there's a fight to be fought. And there's a battle that Christians are in the midst of. But again, it's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. And this is why Christians on earth have traditionally been called the church militant, because they're still in the midst of that spiritual battle every day. That's a spiritual battle that doesn't just apply to the individual Christian. When you think of your individual struggles, and your individual spiritual battles that you face. There's that, but then there's the battle that the whole church faces. As the church seeks to take the gospel into the world, make no mistake that as the church does that, the church is not entering neutral territory. As the church takes the gospel into the world, the church is entering what we might call hostile territory. And we know, according to scripture, that there are forces of evil and darkness that actively oppose Christ and anyone who would follow Christ. And therefore, those who are part of the church militant need to understand the reality of the spiritual battle that is at work and at play in this world. If you don't understand that, then you will not understand the world properly. You will not understand yourself properly. And you will be vulnerable to many, many things. If you read through the book of Acts and you see the church taking the gospel out into the world, you can see patterns that emerge as this spiritual battle unfolds. And I want to mention five elements of this spiritual battle as it unfolds. And then we're going to look at how this unfolds in Acts chapter 13. But there's some patterns that emerge here, not just in chapter 13, but all over the place if you go through the book of Acts. Some elements of this spiritual battle that come up repeatedly. And the first one is the proclamation of the word. The spiritual battle begins when the word is taken out and proclaimed in the world. And as Christians do that we recognize that that is the only way that the gospel can advance. If you read through the book of Acts, the, the, the ministry of the church, as the church multiplies and it grows, that always corresponds to the proclamation of the word, the proclamation of the gospel. In every single case, there is no expansion of the church, there is no growth of the church, there is no multiplication of Christians without the proclamation of the gospel and of the word, which is why this is so central to Christianity today. And it's worth noting that that proclamation from the beginning wasn't limited to just church leaders. Yeah, of course, you see pastors in the New Testament and missionaries and evangelists in the New Testament proclaiming the word. But you see a lot of just ordinary uh, church members and believers who proclaim the word as they took the word to new places and to new people. They understood that to be a Christian was to be a witness for Jesus. They're one and the same, and they just go together. So it begins with proclamation of the word. Then, secondly, we see that there is attraction to the word. Uh, what you see often throughout the book of Acts is when the gospel is preached, people are interested in it. Not everyone's hostile to it. Some people are very interested and attracted to it. See this over and over again. And um, you get the sense that uh, if you do a quick reading that, well, everybody was hostile to it, weren't they? But no, actually many people were attracted to it. And we need to remember this as well, because in our day, I've mentioned this before, but if we assume everyone is hostile to Jesus, then we will be uh, unlikely to ever talk about Jesus, because we will just assume that everyone is going to be hostile to this message. Truth is, not everybody's hostile to the truth about Jesus. There are a lot of people who are searching for answers, who are very spiritually hungry, and when they hear about Christianity or about Christ or about the gospel, they are very interested. So we need to remember that. But along with attraction to the word, then thirdly, you see also another pattern, which is opposition to the word. There's a, every time that God's word is proclaimed, the gospel is, is preached, there's division of those who are attracted to it, those who are opposed to it, repelled by it, some who even might want to attack it. And Jesus warned about this. In John 15, Jesus said, If the world hates you, 
know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. There were many people in in Jesus' day that did not like Jesus. They did not like his teaching. His teaching was very polarizing. Some people were attracted to it. Many people opposed it. Jesus faced fierce opposition. This is one of the great misconceptions. People think, well, Jesus was a popular guy. Everybody loved Jesus. It's not true. Many people did not love Jesus. That's why he was eventually killed. And many people were seeking to kill him throughout his entire ministry. And Jesus said, look, a servant's not greater than his master. If, they, if people responded with that kind of opposition to me, then what should a follower of Jesus expect today? To be a bed of roses? To, that, that we should expect there should be no opposition when we follow, choose to follow Jesus? Absolutely not. There will be opposition to the word as the gospel is proclaimed. Then fourth, there's a fourth piece of this, which we see in Acts, which is defense of the word. Uh, when the early Christians preached about Jesus, talked about Jesus, shared their faith, they faced hostility in many cases, but they didn't sit there quietly. They often defended the gospel and spoke truth back to their opponents. And we see that this is something all Christians are called to. Peter says, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within you. Or I like how John Calvin said it. He said, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth was attacked and remained silent. I mean, if a dog does it, <laughs> dog knows when my master's attacked, I'm going to make some noise. And Christians should be ready to make some noise. If Jesus is opposed, we should be ready to say, no, I'm going to defend what I believe, and I'm ready to do it. Because Jesus is Lord. So we see defense of the word, and then fifth, fifth piece of this that is really important, which is that there's the victory of the word. Although the followers of Christ will face opposition in this world and a persecution, God's word will ultimately be victorious. God guarantees that his word shall succeed. And one of my favorite passages which talks about this is Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I I sent it. God's word, as it goes out, does not fail to accomplish that which he purposes. It shall succeed. It is guaranteed because it carries the authority and the power of God himself. And we see in the book of Acts that no matter how fierce the fight and the battle may be, God's word will prevail. And that truth should encourage us today. Now, I just gave you five elements of this spiritual battle as the church takes the gospel out. The proclamation of the word, it's proclaimed. There's attraction to the word, but then there's also opposition to the word. God's people defend the word. Ultimately, there is victory of the word, and it accomplishes exactly that which God has purposed. So now back to Acts 13. How does this play out in real life? How do we see examples of this in the scriptures? And we see two examples in two cities in Acts 13, and the first is in Cyprus. At the beginning of Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are set apart by the Holy Spirit and they're sent out by the Holy Spirit to go on their first missionary journey. And their first stop is an island called Cyprus. And what do they do when they get to Cyprus? They proclaim the word. Look at verse 5 with me. When they arrived at Salamis, a port of Cyprus, that's a port of Cyprus, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. They preach the word. The very first thing that they do is they proclaim the word. What happens after that? Well, people begin to make, take notice, and you see that there's attraction to the word. Verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. This man is basically a governor 
a, a man of a very high position, and he is so interested in what he's hearing about from Paul and Barnabas wandering around and preaching. He says, get these guys over here. I want to hear more about this. He's attracted to it. He's interested in it. So he asks to hear more. But as soon as he expresses interest in the word, there are others who want to oppose the word. We see opposition to the word. Verse 8, but Alemus the magician, which is the same person from verse 6, Oppose them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. This is really interesting. This magician, this false prophet, apparently had some influence over this guy. And he didn't want to lose that influence. So as soon as he starts taking an interest in Christianity, what does he do? He tries to uh, dissuade him from wanting to consider Christianity. You see this all the time today, don't you? You know, I've talked to people who said, um, I grew up in a... Uh, Christian home that where I, I, not, I grew up in a non-Christian home, a family we didn't, we didn't uh, believe in Christ, but I found Christ, and as soon as I did, uh, I had family members trying to convince me that what I was getting into was totally false. They tried to, to push me away from wanting to follow Jesus. As soon as I found Christ, I experienced opposition to Christ. That's exactly what's going on right here. As soon as the gospel is taking root, there is opposition to the gospel. But Paul's not ready to give up without a fight. And this is where we see defense of the word. Look at verse 9. Paul, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, get this, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. That's a really, really interesting encounter. Paul looks at this because you, you are making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. The straight truth of God is being pronounced and is right in front of you. And what you're doing is you're taking that truth and you are twisting it to make it as if it's not really true or it's not really what it clearly is. And he says to, <laughs> he says to him, he calls him, you son of the devil. Now, that seems like Paul's just getting excited and throwing, lobbing out insults all of a sudden, right? Uh, but I don't think that's actually what's going on here. I don't think he was just trying to think, well, what's the worst insult I can come up with and call this guy a name? The reason why he says son of the devil here is because Paul recognizes that behind every form of opposition to the gospel is ultimately the work of Satan. Satan wants to lead people away from Christ wants to lead people into false teaching, wants to make people buy into lies of all sorts and forms. This is what Satan wants to do and is actively at work in the Lord. And Paul recognizes this. Jesus warned about this. In John 8, 44, he said, the devil has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. And I know there are many people in the world today who think it's strange to talk about the work of Satan or the devil in the world. But um, Jesus talked all the time about the reality of Satan, about the devil, and about how he exists, and about how he influences this world, about how he is at work in this world, and is constantly wanting to influence people in ways that are counter to God's will for their lives. As Christians, we need to understand that we are living in a spiritual battle and it's a war against Satan. And until we understand that, we will never properly understand our lives and the world around us. We just won't. You know, I heard it said once that we need to live life with a wartime mentality. A wartime mentality is the mentality that people live with when they're, when they're living in the midst of war. And there have been times and eras in this country when we've been going through wars, and people during those eras, they lived with a different mentality than they did at peacetime. We need to live life with a wartime mentality. Our war is not a physical war, but it's a, it's a war with Satan. And if we don't have that mentality, we're not going to live in the correct way. We're just not. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. 
Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6. He gave these famous instructions. He said, in Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God. Now, why would he say to instruct someone to put armor on? The only reason, the only reason that you put on armor is if you're going into a battle or to a Renaissance fair. No, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> Take the Renaissance Fair off the table for a minute. The only reason that you put on armor is if you're going into the midst of a fight. In other words, the point of Ephesians 6 is he's saying, this is a war, and you need a wartime mentality. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? The schemes of the devil. He understands what the nature of the battle is. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says it again, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. There's a spiritual battle going on in the world today, and Ultimately, we need to live life with that kind of wartime-like mentality. If we live life with a peacetime mentality, which many Christians do, then we will not follow these instructions. We will not understand the world around us. We will ultimately live our lives as people who are vulnerable to attacks from Satan. Um, and ultimately, I think Satan is probably pretty happy when people live life with a peacetime mentality. Because... If you live life with a peacetime mentality, then you don't suit up and you're not ready to, to fight the battle. And what does Satan probably want the most? He wants people, Christians who are um, complacent, who are apathetic, and who aren't interested in, in fighting any battle. If he can get people to just sit back on the couch and not fight, then Satan doesn't even have to work that hard to oppose the people. He, what he really, really needs to oppose the people is get involved in the battle. But the point is here is that there's a spiritual battle going on, and Paul knew that, which is why he confronted this person in the way in which he did. Now, what do we see at the end of the episode? Well, there is a victory of the word here, because verse 12 says, the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So even in the midst of opposition, there's victory. Let's look at the second place now where Paul and Barnabas visit. This is Antioch in Pisidia. This is a different Antioch than the Antioch that they started in. And when they come to this Antioch, once again, they begin by proclaiming the word. They go into the, Sab they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. They're invited to give an exhortation to the people. Paul gives a sermon in verses 17 through 41. That's a pretty long sermon, and I don't have time to dissect that in, in to little pieces here. But let me just give you a few highlights of some of the main points that he wants to really drive home to the people in the synagogue. First of all, he proclaims to them that Jesus is the Messiah. He proclaims the Messiahship of Jesus. Verse 23 says, Of this man's, that is David's, offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he has promised. In other words, Paul's saying, Look, you are Jews, and you are waiting for a Messiah, and I will tell you who the Messiah is. The Messiah has come, and the Messiah is Jesus. He is already here. What else does he tell them? He doesn't just say that Jesus is the Messiah, but he proclaims the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 32, And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. In other words, Jesus has risen from the dead, and that's the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. So he proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah, he proclaims the resurrection of Jesus, and he also proclaims forgiveness in Jesus. Verse 38, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man's through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. In other words, the law of Moses cannot set you free from your sins, but there's one who can, and that's Jesus. Paul is proclaiming all of these core truths about Christ. And what happens next? Well, there's attraction to the word. Verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them on the next Sabbath. They wanted more. Give us, give us another sermon. Tell us more about this next Sunday, we might say. Verse 44 says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. 
Why, that's every preacher's dream, isn't it? (laughs) The whole city is attracted to this message and is coming out to hear the word proclaimed. But, just like on Cyprus, the gospel attracts, but it also repels, and there is opposition to the word. Verse 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, and they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. So just like on Cyprus, the gospels met with fierce opposition. And once again, what do they do? They defend the word, and they respond. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. What Paul is saying to them here is, is basically, look, the word's been proclaimed to you, but we're not responsible for how you respond to the word. Here's the gospel. You can take it or leave it. We're not responsible for how you respond. And since you are choosing not to respond to the gospel, but to reject the word that is being preached and to contradict what is clearly true according to God's word, then we will proclaim it elsewhere. But the response of the people has no bearing upon whether God's word is victorious in the end. It doesn't matter who might choose to reject God's word because God's word will be victorious in the end. And what do we see in this passage? We see God's word being victorious among those who did respond to it. Verse 48 says this, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Acts 13.48 has given a lot of people trouble over the years. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. When they heard what? When the Gentiles heard this, when they heard what? They heard the gospel they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And then what happened? As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So the gospel's heard. Certain people believe in the gospel. Who are the ones who believe in the gospel? Well, the ones who were appointed to eternal life. What's going on here? What we see in this one verse, but actually this whole passage, is actually God's sovereignty and salvation side by side with man's responsibility to respond to the gospel. Both are side by side. Paul and Barnabas preach the gospel and have the responsibility to do that. The people have the responsibility to respond to the gospel, and some do respond, and the ones who do respond are those who have been appointed to eternal life. Now, it's God's sovereignty and salvation and what we call the doctrine of election, and human responsibility side by side. Both truths are affirmed in the scriptures. It sounds somewhat paradoxical, but the New Testament sees no conflict between both of those things. Both of those are affirmed. And I say this because sometimes people struggle with this question. They say, well, wait a minute, you're talking about taking the gospel out. If God has already appointed those who will believe, if he's already chosen those who will be saved, then what's the point in sharing the gospel? Hasn't he already taken care of it all? The answer to that is actually pretty simple. The reason is because you and I have no idea who is going to believe, and the only way in which God saves people is through them hearing the gospel, the gospel being preached and then them responding to it. God doesn't just zap people on the head and all of a sudden they say, well, I'm a Christian all of a sudden. You know, it's not like some guy sitting on his couch drinking beer and watching uh, a game and all of a sudden he says, whoa, I just became a Christian. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. The only way in which you have become a Christian and I have become a Christian and anyone becomes a Christian, as Paul says in Romans 10, is that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In other words, the gospel has to be preached. There's a responsibility to do it. And those who hear it have a responsibility before God to respond. And what Acts 13.48 says, when the Gentiles heard this, when they heard the gospel, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The New Testament sees no conflict between God's sovereignty and salvation 
and our responsibility to preach the gospel. In fact, it was J.I. Packer who said, and I'm going to quote him again in a minute, but it was J.I. Packer who said, God's sovereignty and salvation is the only thing that assures us that anybody's going to ever respond to the gospel. Because if it wasn't God who was out there changing hearts and bringing people to faith, then our preaching and our sharing Christ would be totally in vain because nobody would respond. I don't have the power to bring somebody to faith, and neither do you. Only God can do that. And so it's only God's sovereignty and salvation that actually assures us that, 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 that sharing Christ not only can be effective, but will be effective. Packer also said this, many years ago. He said, God's way of saving sinners is to bring them to faith through bringing them into contact with the gospel. In God's ordering of things, therefore, evangelism is necessary if anyone is to be saved at all. We must realize, therefore, that when God sends us to evangelize, he sends us to act as vital links in the chain of his purpose for the salvation of his elect. The fact that he has such a purpose and that it is a sovereign purpose that cannot be thwarted does not imply that, after all, our evangelizing is not needed for its fulfillment. Both are affirmed in the scriptures. Our command and the necessity to share Christ and also God's sovereignty. When the Gentiles heard this, Acts 13, 48, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The word was victorious that day. And that brings us to our day. There's still a spiritual battle going on in the world today. It has not changed. The question is, are we aware that that battle is taking place? And are we ready to take up the cause of Christ? There's no question that those who choose to follow Christ will encounter great difficulties, will encounter opposition, will encounter persecution. But those who choose to serve Christ and who choose to follow Christ were also assured of great victories. I want to close this morning with these words from R. Kent Hughes. He said, there is a cost to sincere service for Christ. Never share your faith, and you will never look like a fool. Never stand for righteousness, and you will never be rejected. Never walk out of a movie or a play because it's offensive, and you'll never be called a prig. Never practice consistent honesty in business, and you will not lose the trade of a not-so-honest associate. Never reach out to the needy, and you'll never be taken advantage of. Never give your heart, and it will never be broken. Never go to Cyprus, and you will never be subjected to a dizzy, heart-convulsing confrontation with Satan. Seriously follow Christ, and you will experience a gamut of sorrows almost completely unknown to the unbeliever. But, but, of course, you will also know the joy of adventure with the Lord of the universe and spiritual victory as you live a life of allegiance to him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And Lord, we often are aware that we either do not recognize the battles that we face, or Lord, we have not properly equipped ourselves for those battles. Lord, forgive us for those things. We pray that you would help us to do what your servant Paul instructed Timothy to do, which was to fight the good fight of faith, to put on the armor of God, to be willing to suffer the reproach of this world because we care only about your approval, Lord. Lord, strengthen us for the battle that we face. Protect us from the attacks of the evil one. For Lord, we desire to be faithful to you.
And we long for the day when we will join the church triumphant to join all of those who have gone before us in faith and have now entered their heavenly rest. So Lord, we look forward to that day. And we ask in the meantime, Lord Jesus, that you would come quickly and make all things new. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.